Hey sickos, I'm LJ. And I'm Toe. And this is Say Psycho Right Now. Say Psycho Right Now is a true crime and paranormal podcast. Some content may be considered disturbing or graphic. This podcast also contains adult language. Listener discretion is advised. To access our socials or become a Patreon member with access to early episodes and bonus content, find us on any social media platform and consult the link tree in our bio or go to www.patreon.com slash say psycho right now. You can also follow us on our socials or wherever you stream your podcasts and leave a five-star review if you're enjoying our content so we can continue to reach more people. This is a great free way to support your favorite content creators. Case suggestions or stories to share can also be sent to saypsychorightnow at gmail.com. Now let's get into today's episode. Yay! Hey, sickos. Welcome back. Hey. Great to have you back for another heinous crime. Oh, and so glad you mentioned that today, LJ, because this crime is fucking heinous. Oh, well, um, now I hate that I said that. Oh, God. I mean, you... I know they always are, but still. Yeah, if you were here, if you're an OG and you were here from season one for Madeline McCann, number one, thanks for growing with us. Number two... You're going to see Toe get Madeline McCann mad. Maybe oh, no. even madder. Because I think we edited some of my rage out on that one. Because LJ we made me. We literally did. I was like, I hear you. Super mad. Super mad. Feel you. However. <laughs> we can't behave like this publicly. Yeah. I was like, we, we, we need to take her from like a 10 to like a 5. If we can. Yeah. So here's the thing. Today's case. Yeah. Okay, let's just get into it. As you know, we don't do trigger warnings here, but we do give warnings with cases involving deaths of children, and that's going to be, mm -hmm. unfortunately, the case today. Um, there's also mentions of racism. It's it's pretty foul. Mm -hmm. Coverage. So this is a case that I haven't seen covered a lot, you know, there's documentaries and stuff out there there's media coverage but as far as like in the true crime podcast space i haven't mm -hmm. seen a whole lot of coverage for this especially like you know the bigger people we all know who they are no shade at them but i just i haven't seen it done so today's story is going to be the case of the hart family now i do want to point out a source that i relied on heavily for this episode and that is a documentary entitled A Thread of Deceit, The Hart Family Tragedy. Now, I want to be very clear here that most of what I took from this is the testimony of the neighbors, which we'll get into a little later on this case. And I, I want to point out, if you want to watch this documentary, knock yourself out, but there's a lot of friends of these two women that appear to be kind of defending them a little bit. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's not what we're going to be doing here today. Yeah, no. I understand that 
in this case, the mothers also killed themselves during the course of this tragedy. And I understand that there was probably some mental illness at play here, but ultimately these two women abused the hell out of these children for years. And we're not going to be defending that here today. We just, we don't stand for that. And there's documentation and eyewitness testimony that supports this having happened. So Jennifer and Sarah Hart are the parents and the perpetrators in this case. And they were both South Dakota natives. Jennifer was the eldest of two siblings, while Sarah was the eldest of three. After high school, Sarah attended University of Minnesota, while Jennifer attended Augustana University. However, both women eventually transfer transferred to Northern State University, which is where they met and began their relationship. Mm-hmm. Both were majoring in elementary education and Sarah went on to graduate in 2002 while Jennifer dropped out. And in 2005, seeing as how at this time they could not legally be married at the time, Sarah went ahead and legally changed her last name to Hart, which was Jennifer's last name. The couple did later end up being married in Connecticut in 2009. In 2004, the couple moved to Alexandria, Minnesota, where they both were employed at a store called Herberger's, which was, from what I gathered, it was just like a department store. So in 2006, the Hearts adopted their first three children, Abigail, Hannah, and Marcus, all biological siblings. Their mother was featured in the documentary about this case that I mentioned, and she stated that she voluntarily relinquished her parental rights to try and give her children a better life. She was just trying to make the best decision that she could for her kids. Now, what one of the things that infuriates me about this case, and there's a lot, there's a lot, but one of those things is the number of red flags and how many fucking times the system failed these kids. How many Hi. fucking times the system And the powers that be failed to realize that these two monsters had no business caring for children. And so I want to start here with red flag number one. And this comes just prior actually to the adoption of the first three children that I just mentioned, Abigail, Hannah, and Marcus. Mm -hmm. So prior, just prior to their adoption, Jennifer and Sarah were fostering a 15 year old girl Now, the two women told their young foster daughter that they were adopting three younger children and that she would be their big sister. Now, the exact dates and duration of this foster are unclear to me. However, we do know that just prior to the adoption of the three children, the Hearts dropped their 15-year-old foster daughter at a therapy session and left. Upon arrival to therapy, the young girl was informed that Sarah and Jennifer would not be coming back for her. Oh my god how traumatic they just just fucking dumped her off and also i mean it's my understanding that the the therapist i don't know if the therapist is the one that told her therapist if you're listening to this and you were you were in on this scheme fuck you stop being a therapist because you suck so awful (laughs) so awful like I mean, you know, and I, again, I don't have the exact context here. It was, there wasn't a whole lot of information on this exact incident in my research, but it sounds like to me, they dropped her off at therapy. They were kind of communicating maybe with the therapist prior to basically have her break this to the kid I, I, or, or him. I don't know if it was a man or a woman, but right. when I think of trash therapists, I think of women, but that's a story for another time. <laughs> Yikes. Uh. It's my own experience. Okay. Now, in 2008, the Hearts adopted their other three children, Sierra, Devante, and Jeremiah, and they were another set of biological siblings. Now, the story of how this second set of adopted children came to be with the Hearts is important, in my opinion, because, again, it goes to show how the system failed these kids from the job. Now, their mother lost custody of them due to issues with substance abuse. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, though, they did end up being placed with an aunt who was said to have been a really good and 
like caretaker for them. This was said to be a positive environment for the kids. Mm -hmm. She was said to have gone to really great lengths to provide for these children up to and including selling her home to purchase a larger home in which she could accommodate all of the children and satisfy the courts. So, I mean, that's, that's a big step to take. You know what I mean? This isn't her just saying, begrudgingly saying, Oh, I guess I'll take them. No, like she right. wanted these kids. Um, now, unfortunately one day, you know, part of the agreement of her having the kids was that they were not to be left alone with their biological mother as she had, you know, lost custody for substance abuse. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, one day she, she had to work and she did allow the biological mother to babysit the children. And unfortunately, a social worker dropped by unannounced that day and observed this taking place. Now, and the, the children were immediately removed from the home. Now, in the documentary, yeah. attorney Shonda Jones, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure if she directly handled the case. I think either she or her, at least her law firm had some involvement directly with the case but that wasn't clearly stated in the documentary right but she stated that it was it was really cold to remove the children immediately for this with no hearing or any due process and i'm inclined to agree i i think that the aunt was wrong for allowing the biological mother to babysit the kids obviously she was not supposed to be doing this right. but this did not need to result in the children being immediately and expeditiously removed children have been left in far worse situations this is something where they could have brought her in and said hey -uh -uh, no don't do that again you know what i mean yeah kept supervising the situation it, it didn't need to come to this so now we have the heart family complete right and we have what appears to be this perfect model of this progressive family we have two white lesbian moms with six adopted black kids and you're probably wondering, Toe, why is this relevant? Why, why are we, why are we getting into, well, you're, you're going to find out. You're going to find out why that's relevant. It was performative. It was all, it, and, and this is my opinion. We'll never know. Everybody in this family is, you know, passed on now, mm -hmm. but we have documentation of one child coming out and saying that these moms were racist right right we have evidence of abuse severe abuse that we're going to get into here in a second it, it was all fucking performative right. it's as if it's as if they intentionally went out and adopted these kids to paint and image it because they were incredibly active on social media appearing to be heavily involved in things like the black lives matter movement sure but you've got six black children living in your home that you're torturing. Right. So incredibly fucked up. You see what I'm saying? So it, it I, and I'll never know if they intentionally sought to adopt outside of their race. Mm -hmm. But to me, I mean, it's like, it, it just looks kind of weird that, you know, you're, you're heavily involved in, in the, in the black lives matter movement because you have, adopted six black kids but yet you're fucking starving and beating them right and you've got you know i don't know and now i'm not here to say that they would have treated white children any better because at the end of the day these women are child abusers that's what they are sure but and there's an additional layer of just like the performative like the performative it, act yeah and we also know that we have a lot of systemic racism at play in our CPS system here in America. Sure. If you're not from America, maybe you don't know, but I think the majority of our audience is from the U.S. Black children are removed at a way higher rate for way less than white right. kids. You know what I mean? So, um... It, it's a fucking problem. It's a fucking problem. Yeah. That's, that's the best I can say. Now, along with a myriad of other issues within the CPS system, it, it leaves the door hanging wide up open for shit like this to happen. And now we have six children who have lost their lives for no fucking reason. 
Right. So also in 2008, the same year that the second three children, second, sorry, the second set of siblings, let's say, were adopted, comes our second red flag. While residing in Minnesota, Hannah, who we know was born in 2002, we don't have exact birth dates or dates for these incidents, but, you know, it's 2008, she was born in 2002, so she would have been six or nearly six at the time of this incident. Mm -hmm. Her teacher noticed bruises on her left arm, and subsequently Hannah disclosed that they were a result of Jennifer beating her with a belt. Shortly after this, all of the children were removed from the public school system for about a year. I, I'm, I'm sure CPS was contacted at this point, but I don't have exact details on this. Yeah, instance. I would just think that with the teacher knowing action taking place, we generally know that mandated reporting is a thing. Yeah. It sounds like that is likely what happened. Sure. Now, again, in, in 2010 or 2011, different sources had different dates. Abigail told her teacher that she had what she referred to as owies on her stomach and her back. They were, they were, ended up being extensive bruises. The teacher inquired as to where the bruises came from and Abigail replied that her mom had hit her. A report was made in the family question and Sarah admitted to letting, quote, letting her anger get out of control and spanking the little girl the day prior. Mm. Ma'am. Her stomach and her back are covered in bruises. I that was want not a to lose my control on this mother. Like as and a mother, that's like makes me sick. Let me like, be. Let me be very clear. We don't. We don't even condone really spanking here. We don't condone hitting kids in any context. But that's not a fucking spanking. No, no, that is beating your baby. I'm like tearing up because I just think of like Lenny. Or you know what I mean? Or even be No, and I and I do. And well, and I think of like you know what I think of? I think of how much respectfully and with love they drive me to my absolute wits end sometimes, and I still could absolutely never. Literally never, because at the end of the day they're just precious little butter beans who have no emotional regulation <laughs> That's exactly like i literally could absolutely never no matter how done how overstimulated and i don't have kids but you know but the kids we L- do have in our lives have underdeveloped frontal lobes okay uh, lg's kids have <laughs> <laughs> done their fair share of driving me up a wall at different points in oh, trust me and i'm like with the baby on the way and so many changes right now they yeah. are in their feral era i mean they're, they're excited for era. the baby but you know mom's been sick there's this there's that and you know like, like life is life but still, life is life like, she still could just never like how i mean how could you not have enough heart to stop yourself before it gets to this point right oh 100%. how could i just i can't imagine now abigail told investigators that jennifer had held her head under cold water and punched her repeatedly <sighs> because this is going to make you not that there's ever any reason for this but the reason that they came up with is going to make you want to stab somebody because they found a penny on her and believe she had stolen it. Get the fuck out of here. Let that little honey steal the penny. Um, police also interviewed the rest of the children who informed them that they were frequently subject to harsh physical punishment and also denied food. In the end, Sarah actually took the blame for hitting Abigail, even though, you know, Jennifer was the one who allegedly did it. And she was sentenced to probation and one year of community service. Fuck that. About a year after this incident, it is said that Hannah told a school nurse that she had not had anything to eat all day and the children remained in the home despite all of this. Mm -hmm. Additionally, they were removed from the public school system once more, this time for good, ultimately isolating them from anyone who may have been able to get them any kind of help. Now, in in 2013, the family was once again answering to the authorities in regards to child abuse allegations. 
And by this time, they were residing in Oregon, and the authorities were aware of the previous allegations that had taken place during their time in Minnesota. An investigation was launched, and this consisted of each member of the family being interviewed separately, as well as family and friends of the couple being interviewed. And during the course of this investigation, several sources close to the family made some pretty disturbing claims. Mm -hmm. They claimed that the children were required to raise their hands before speaking. They were not allowed to wish each other a happy birthday, and they were not allowed to laugh at the dinner table. It was also reported that once a pizza had been ordered for the children for dinner, but they were only allowed to have a very small slice. And upon realizing that the entire pizza had been consumed, which, I mean... It's one fucking pizza for eight people, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, literally, there's four of us, and we always order, like, two and an app. Literally. And four of, two of those people are small children that really don't, you know, yeah, consume that much. The children were punished by not being fed breakfast the following morning and being forced to lie on their bed for five hours straight. Oh. Unfortunately... The children themselves didn't reveal any new instances of abuse in their interviews during the course of this particular investigation. And Jen herself, during her interview, claimed that their only problem was that people couldn't handle two lesbian moms with six black children. Oh, I'm the victim. Again, again, it, it's just, it's fucking performative. And it's disgusting. Right. It's literally just so that they can claim, like, oh, we're being discriminated against. No, you're just fucking incompetent, terrible people. Literally. Fucking monsters. Now, in May of 2017, the family moved to a new home in Woodland, Washington. Now, in the documentary, their neighbors spoke out quite a bit, and they're going to play a pretty significant role in this story. The neighbors at their new home here in Washington. Mm -hmm. They seemed to notice relatively quickly that there was something off about this family, namely that they had, you know, six children and that they were never really seen or heard. And typically a house with that many kids would not be a very quiet one. No, I was um, just about to say, coming from a family of eight kids and also now having two kids myself, can yeah. fucking confirm <laughs> that it should not be quiet. Yeah. You know, they said that they never noticed the kids playing outside. Once again, the moms were very active on social media presenting this image of their perfect family. And the neighbor in the documentary, the neighbor Dana DeKalb references a photo that had been posted to Facebook of the children outside playing in the snow. And she says, these kids weren't outside playing in the snow. But yet there's Weird. this perfectly staged you know photo on social media of uh, the kids outside with like i think they had like little thermoses maybe supposed to be with like hot cocoa or something and like it was just like this cute little stage so it's like almost as though they know what they should be doing but are actively choosing to abuse children instead great correct exactly great. exactly dana and her husband as well as others in their life such as the children's former teacher described the children as being quite thin and frail. Mm -hmm. In August of 2017, in the wee hours of the morning, maybe around 2 or 3 a.m., Hannah, who we know was born in 2002, so she would have been around 15 at this time, jumped from the family's second-story window and ran over to the DeKalb's home. She rang the doorbell, they answered, and Hannah just basically came barging through the door. Dana stated that Hannah was covered in grass and weeds and was just absolutely terrified. She began begging the neighbors to please help her, stating that her mothers were racists who were abusing them. Oh, so this is where we have one kid flat out coming. I mean, and she's 15, so she, you know, this isn't just a word she heard somewhere. She's 15. Sure. She understands what she's saying. She's coming. She's saying, no, these women are racist towards right. us their own adopted children right meanwhile jen and sarah as well as some of the other children were out searching for hannah and she begged the decalbs not to let them know she was there when they came looking for her mm -hmm. unfortunately the two women did eventually come to the residence looking for her and dana's husband did disclose that she was there now i don't exactly blame him for this because you 
it's a stressful and confusing position to be in when a random kid barges into your house at you know two three in the morning sure and you also can't just harbor runaway children in your home sure i i think i don't know where this is going so i would just say that like you know sure say she's there but also say and law enforcement is on the way you know something like that right right and so right well and so that's where i was gonna go with this is that what i don't agree with is the fact that he decided not to contact the authorities Mm. as he quote didn't want to get involved that i don't agree with oh i don't agree with that at all um law enforcement should have made that determination absolutely now thankfully it would appear that a few days later actually dana's father who didn't reside there at the home and i don't believe he even resided in the area but he heard of the incident secondhand from his daughter Mm -hmm. and he actually opted to contact police the 911 call was playing in the documentary and you can tell this gentleman was just sick over the thought of what might be happening to these children right if you guys have heard the ruby frankie 911 call where the neighbor called it it reminded me so much of that call i mean this is Mm. this gentleman was so emotional he stated you know what had happened and that he was extremely concerned for the children so on and so forth he also mentioned that the morning following the incident The hearts had made Hannah come over with a letter she had written apologizing to the neighbors for disturbing their peace and making up lies. Mm. Right. Okay. So Dana described the children as standing at attention during this encounter and looking utterly terrified. Now, like I mentioned, Dana's father did contact 911, and I couldn't find in my research really any details about a subsequent investigation resulting from that particular 911 call. Right. But either way, we do know that once again, these children were not removed from the situation because several months later, in March of 2018, Devante began coming over to, to the DeKalb's at home asking for food. And what began as small requests for maybe just some bread or something started turning into frequent, even daily asks for staple food items like, and they're teenagers. So this is not like little kids coming up and asking their neighbors for candy and chips. This is them right. asking for things like bread, peanut butter, canned meat, like canned foods, you know, anything non-perishable so that they could hide it from their parents. He Mm -hmm. would ask Dana to hide the food near the fence in a spot where Jen and Sarah couldn't notice it. Eventually, Dana was able to get him to admit that they were being severely abused and that their parents were withholding food as punishment. At that point, she did decide to contact CPS. Now, following this report, CPS first attempted to make contact with the family on March 23rd, 2018. The family on this occasion refused to answer the door and cps attempted once more to make contact three days later on march 26th but by this time jen and sarah had loaded their suv with all six of their children and left the home never to return again while cps they'd also called law enforcement like not just one if you know it's that bad but it's again the amount of people that failed these kids it's so so tough makes me so sad i mean how many fucking times can you actually fuck up yeah you know what i mean like while cps was attempting to make contact with the family over 500 miles away on highway one in i hope i'm saying this correctly mendocino county california Mm -hmm. a german tourist stumbled upon the scene of a horrific crash a gmc yukon had driven off of a cliff and was upside down on the beach below inside the vehicle were the bodies of jennifer and sarah hart all of the children had been ejected from the vehicle during the crash none of them were wearing seat belts mm-hmm. um the bodies of 19 year old marcus 14 year old jeremiah and 14 year old abigail were found nearby two weeks later 12 year old sierra's body was found god you guys i'm having a feeling and i don't have feelings <laughs> it's just so heartbreaking Um, she was found washed up on a beach and a few days later a foot that was still inside of a shoe washed up on a beach 
and DNA testing confirmed that it belonged to 16 year old Hannah. The, the body of 15 year old Devante still to this day has not been found. Although Mm -hmm. it has been confirmed beyond a reasonable doubt that he was in the vehicle at the time of the crash. Mm -hmm. And as a result, his death certificate has been signed. Now, the investigation that naturally ensued after this crash reveals that this was absolutely an intentional act. Jen was driving the vehicle at the time of the crash, and she was found to be intoxicated well above the legal limit. Nobody, Mm -hmm. again, like I said, nobody in the vehicle been wearing a seatbelt. And it is also revealed that Sarah, as well as at least two of the children, some sources say two children, some say all of them had pretty significant amounts of Benadryl in their systems, well Mm -hmm. above the normal dose. Um. Additionally, data collected from the vehicle revealed that the vehicle accelerated from a full stop, applying full throttle, and drove straight off the cliff without any attempts to stop. There was also, you know, phone records with Google searches showing, you know, searches for things like how long, it was something to the effect of like, how how long does it take to die from drowning? You know, things mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. So definitely so, stuff indicating premeditation. And yeah, definitely like indicating through premeditation. Um, guys, I, I don't even know what to say about this fucking case, except for CPS. I know you're overworked. I know you're underpaid, but do fucking better. Yeah, this can't happen. Do fucking better because this cannot happen. After, after the first child was found covered in bruises, why are they still there? Yeah. It, it's just, literally, what can you even say? What can you even say? You, you remove the, the you remove three of the children from their mm-hmm. aunt. Mm-hmm. For making a poor choice in babysitter. But yet you don't remove the children when one of them is found with the Covered shit beat out of them. Bruises. Yeah. Covered in bruises, not being fed. Make it make fucking sense. Make it make fucking sense. Right. I I guys, this one is just I, I can't. I fucking can't. Um, it, it really is. It's, I mean, the shit that CPS will remove kids for and then not remove. And this is a common theme. Like, we see this all the time. We see mm-hmm. good families losing their kids over something absolutely asinine. Mm-hmm. And then we have shit like this. I mean, it just, it's, I don't know, man. I don't know. It's truly I'm, ridiculous. I'm going to really be sitting ridiculous. here bitching about this for the next four hours if we keep going. But that's all we have for you today for this case. Where were we at? Let's see. Next week. Next week. Next week. Next week. So next week, you guys have tentatively um, the Honey Bee Killer, which will be hosted by LJ tentatively. We might have to do a swap Um, and for Patreon, Patreons, Patreons, that is Patreons. who you are, Patreons. For our little special people, you guys will be getting an Off Topic Tuesday next, and it's going to be LJ and I's unserious run-ins with the law. <laughs> oh my god. Prepare yourselves to just be like these bitches. <laughs> oh, it's going to be good. And then for the following week's bonus episode, you're going to be getting a what the fuck Igwick, and it's going to be the case of Heather Garris, which is going to be hosted by yours truly. So lots of great stuff coming up. Thank you guys for tuning in. <laughs> oh. I'm sorry, the panic I felt when you said Heather Garris, because I was looking at the calendar and I got our calendars mixed up for a second, and I was like, I haven't done that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. 
not no, it. That's my, that's, my, that's my Toto job. Um, oh, thank God. She's like, Jesus. That's like the panic attack I had last oh, week when I thought apart. I was I thought I was hosting Yellow Jackets. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, my, no, guys, I have it outlined. My toxic season two trait is that I perpetually forget to do yellow jackets yellow jackets until, like tuesday <laughs> she, she's like the day before she's like oh i need to watch that <laughs> like <laughs> and these yellow jackets episodes i'll just have you guys know for those of you who aren't our patrons right um yeah. these are routinely hour-long episodes uh but you guys should if you're not a patreon member already should definitely check it out we still have our free three-week trial available Which um, i feel like when, it's like a forever thing right yeah it, it's a forever thing what's not a forever thing is our bonfire campaigns the shirts mm, when you guys thing. yeah you guys will hear this patreon members it'll be november 3rd and public it'll be november 6th the thing is that this batch number one is going to close on november 1st But we might open up another batch at some point in time. When we open up batches, they're limited for just a set amount of time, usually like Mm. 15 days. So just keep an eye out for those. We'll continue to keep you posted on our socials if we bring back another batch. Perfect. Okay. Beautiful. Thank you for hanging in with us on this heinous murder. I think I did pretty good not getting like super mad. Mm, Yeah. No, I think you were reasonable mad. I think I could have gotten madder. Yeah, which is valid. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Great talk. Okay. All right, I'm going to go hug my kids and feed them Cool Whip. Oh my god, tell them I love them so fucking much and their Aunt Toe's favorites. I will pass that along. Love you guys so much. Okay, toodaloo. Bye.